cut you up. Rishi Thank, Thank you. I, I have a few follow-ups, and then I'm going to go on to international trade and safe openness. Just on sanctions, the Prime Minister, in an answer to me, uh, I think it was last week, um, said that he intends, there is an intention to um, to sanction the state-owned bank, Serba Bank and Gazprom Bank, and the non-state one. Uh, I think it was that was in reference to Alpha Bank. So do you have much more on that? He, he did say he intended to. It was a, is a very clear, rather surprisingly clear and um, uh, uh, helpful answer. He said yes. Do, do you have much more? No, Would I you don't. be able to write I mean, these, to us about that? Well, these because conversations, Bushnara, the these conversations are literally live sure. going on now. So I can't... Days. No, I don't, no, 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 I'm not asking you yeah. to answer the question right now with respect. What I said was, picking up on Kevin's point... The, 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 this is a. This was just for your information. The prime minister actually said in the chamber that there was an intention. No, no, to I saw it. I saw what he said banks. to you. <laughs> what would be helpful there? is to know whatever you are able to provide in mm. writing to us on where that's got to. Yeah, I just appreciating the points that have been made, yep. but, but he had said there was an intention to sanction. Yep. Um, so I was. Awesome. To I shall you send you the fullest answer I can on all the elements you've. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, just um, guy, while we've got you here. Uh, I you asked me about something of... completely off the scope. No. Sorry? You ask us something completely off the scope. It wasn't off the scope. No, no. <laughs> okay, crap on. So <laughs> <you're>... <laughs> I'm just pulling your leg. We're so. about to find out. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're that clever. No, okay. I'm certainly not. Okay. Um, so, Guy, there are some issues around market failures in the insurance sector, and obviously with Brexit, there have been lots of concerns about what's insurable and, and what sort of insurance cover people get, whether it's to do with car insurance, holiday insurance, health insurance, and so on. Um, I just wondered if, if the, your department's done any work around market failures and um, recently, and what, what the government could do to try and address the gaps where the insurance market um, assesses risks in particular ways. For instance, if you have a disability I or can, I can, conditions. I can cut you short because no is the answer, okay. and not that I'm aware of, partly because the assessment of insurance would not be something that uh, my department would do. If you're raising sort of, is that linked to Solvency 2? I have long advocated that the reforms to Solvency 2 are a really good thing, and that does impact upon DWP to a degree. But no, in terms of have we done inquiries on car so insurance? Would that be, it would be for you then, John. Sorry. Sorry, apologies. For you then, is there anything? So, market what Guy and I have done in the financial uh, inclusion policy forum is look at where you have got yep. gaps of provision, and uh, we looked at with the industry about how you how you address that. Part of it is because what you what you say. Well, could you find a way of getting you know social landlords to put in Insurance, for example, have some contents insurance into the the the, um, the rent, as it were. Those are the sorts of things that we've looked at. Um, I, I mean, in terms of the poverty premium that does exist across a range of everyday services, um, part of it is often driven by data and the fact yeah. access to data. I'm not aware of a specific instance. The only the only thing that I can tell you about about insurance, the insurance industry does fall under me is around um, what happened recently with respect to a renewal not being able to be uh, at a higher price than the, the new customer offer, which I think has reoriented quite a lot because people just keep rolling over their existing contract. Um, but I think this is an area where I'd be up for looking at it because I do think there probably yeah, are solutions because yeah, it's about just, pooling it's the... Up quite a sorry, lot. Certainly yeah. in terms of my work and, and uh, case work and, and so on, because there have been issues around pre-existing health conditions yeah. um, where it's quite difficult, for instance, with travel. Um, yeah. to, it's much more expensive to get insurance. Older people, um, there's a whole range of, there's a range of different groups that find yeah. themselves in uh, complicated circumstances. The, the other thing I've picked up, that, and just, again, just on that, sorry, can I just, just say that? Just finish this point, which, on, is, you go, you go. which is to do with um, landlords, uh, freeholders, and insurance. So building, so sort of tower blocks and building insurance, yeah. where there, some some resident leaseholders have, yeah. have had trouble getting insurance. So I just feel there may be a case for looking at this in the round around um, uh, around where the gaps are and what. Um, what the role of the market as well as government can so, be. So. so the Secretary of State for levelling up and 
Home, uh, house <laughs> dealer. Home dealer. <laughs> he wrote to the FCA asking, is, is there an industry failure with respect to that provision yeah. on, the, on the insurance? And the FCA are looking into that at the moment. So yeah. I think that's something specific. I just, but yeah. I, want, I want to show an openness and, and sincerely to look at specifics around, particularly <coughs> the poorest people around exclusion. I'm very happy to look at what you've got to say on that and to see if I can find a way of bringing it forward in the financial inclusion forum. I know you had the ABI, and I think Charlotte Clark, who used to uh, be my lead civil servant, gave evidence to you. But on uh, low income access to insurance, yes. they, as of December 2021, the two of us did the Financial Inclusion Policy Forum, where there is a subgroup specifically looking at low income um, uh, policy insurance for houses and contents, yeah. mm. particularly because that is quite clearly a problem and access to that, a bit like basic bank accounts was brought mm. in to deal with the problem in respect of uh, access to a bank account. It, it's a work in progress. It would not be right to say it's been fixed, but it, there is already work being done. My strong advice is write to the ABI and get the update on, from them. Okay. Um, and the, the industry did do something on exclusion of older people, um, and I think they had something like I seem to remember, like, was it 700,000 inquiries as a consequence of something they set up for people who've been excluded to get the travel insurance if they're over 75? And the other one is the household, uh, so housing associations. We've changed the rules so that housing associations can assist um, in terms of referring for insurance. I, I think you'll find, tenants. just it, I put, want to put it on your agenda as ministers, because I think you'll find there are still gaps, mm. um, yeah. Yeah, especially with those with pre-existing health conditions and so on, yeah. where insurance tends to be much higher. And then you've got this, this wider... Yeah. But, but the, the area around market failures is, is an area for, um, uh, for, for action, I think, uh, in government as well as elsewhere. So I just wanted you to just pick, uh, take it away and, and consider what else could be done. Um, on on uh, Solvency 2 um, and the, yeah. the question that the Chair was asking about risk margins and, and uh, matching adjustment, do you see any trade-offs or tensions between... Obviously, we've heard lots of enthusiasm about reform, and we can see why, and, and there's issues around where there could be um, uh, opportunities for investment uh, if the reforms are done appropriately. But do you see any risks to pensioners, yes or no? Um, are you going to mitigate it if there uh, are? Shall I go first? So, I mean, uh, the answer is, clearly, the devil's in the detail. One has to accept that. This is He's going to get that right, isn't he? Yeah, well, well, yes, but also, I have been calling for this for some particular time. So, and actually, I think it will help pensioners in a number of different ways. The, 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 first, the first key is I, I cannot stress enough that it, it is bizarre that we have a system that is more onerous than perfectly legitimate competitors. Um, and secondly, you know, we're in a situation where the capital requirements are, we have a mass of capital without it being fundamentally used or being required to cover the risks that are out there. Now, that seems to me utterly illogical use of capital. And the final bit is there is inevitably, in my view, it will make buyout, which is in the pensioner's interest. So if I have, a, um, if I have an occupational pension and I want to get an insurance buyout at the end of the day, if you have a relaxation of Solvency 2, it will be easier to get to a buyout situation because at the moment it's exceptionally hard. And I've got a bunch of people between 90% PPF are being bailed out by the state and 110% being bought out by an insurance company. And there are a load of different pension schemes in the middle there who are struggling along. If that 110% comes down even by a percentage point, life gets a lot easier for people to get the buyout, which is better for the individual pensioner without a shadow of a doubt. Did you want to add anything to this? To this question. I want to add anything. No, I mean, I, I see this as the regime we've got is not optimised for our in, our insurance industry. I don't see this as a deregulatory thing. I see it's a right sizing. And you I don't, don't you see, don't see a tension in terms of trying to release release money for investment and anything that could happen in terms of safeguarding interests of pensioners. We, we no. should be confident that you're well, going to get get the balance yes. right. I mean, yes, because other countries have done it, um, who were perfectly reputable, and more particularly. Um, the investment you're talking in alternative assets, so asset-backed investment, uh, is a perfectly legitimate investment. Okay. So, given the profile of obligations they've got in terms of life insurance and payouts, it's a question of what you can properly match against that. And I want us to move to a world where we can invest in other things. I think that's entirely reasonable 
the insurance companies want to do it. They can, you know, and we're talking about infrastructure. With, but no, we're no, I, about I, I'm sorry. for that, but I think the question was about getting the balance right and protection. Look, the, 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 look, look at Canada, look at the Canadian Pensions uh, Super Fund or the Australian Super Funds. These are massive organisations who own very, very large bits of property. King's Cross is owned, for example, by an overseas uh, pension fund. All the development there. There are, you know, they own things like airports. These are very substantial pieces of infrastructure. I mean, Gareth spent his previous life uh, organising half of these things. Okay, well, okay, but on to international trade and safe openness then. So, John, I've got a rather technical question for you, which is about the C CCPs um, and CSDs. So this is the proposal of the Treasury in the Treasury's consultation that yeah. um, that that the UK should have regard to the financial stability impact of UK CCPs and CSDs on other jurisdictions. Um, did the Treasury consider a similar requirement for other parts of the regulatory regulatory system? Um, I think the point is with these two is they're part of our fundamental infrastructure. Yeah. So they they're not they're not really in the same category. They're something that needs to function in all circumstances and we're not going to gain it's not you know, sort of gain growth and competitiveness through them they are just sort of fundamental planks of our infrastructure in the city okay um and do you think that other jurisdictions should do more to consider spillover risks for global financial stability uh uh resulting from their financial systems it's not for me to talk to other jurisdictions. I think what we do is we take an active role in international fora and work do collaboratively. Do you have a view on it? Well, I have a view for the UK, which is that, you know, which I'll set out in the future regulatory framework. Given we're interdependent. Well, Shinara, I don't take responsibility for other jurisdictions. I say that what we will do is take responsibility as a global player in financial services regulation. And Gwyneth and uh, some of her senior you to take colleagues. Responsibility. Can I just answer the question? I can never answer the question. No, I'm not. I'm just saying that I can't tell you what other jurisdictions will or won't do. What I what I can say is that we are involved in international conversations and will continue to be, even post Brexit, in actually trying to, to find a respectable and the right course forward. We will try and use that influence in our dialogues through economic and financial dialogues, through our conversations with different jurisdictions to you know, put our perspectives that I've, I'm accountable for into the, into the mix. But I mean, we, that's, that's, the, that's what I was getting at. I wasn't asking you to be responsible for other, other jurisdictions. Um, turn, turning on to um, uh, tr uh, trade, um, what's the dynamic like... Um, between regulators and, and the Treasury um, when negotiating international trade agreements. And I appreciate it's led by other, obviously there's the, the DIT lead, um, but what sort of issues do, uh, do the regulators tend to highlight in, in those sorts of, in, in, in well, the context of trade agreements? The regulators in terms of financial services aren't really very involved in that. I take an interest from the point of view of services more generally. Um, in terms of uh, labour restrictions, for example, where data gets involved, making sure that we've got agreements that align with precedents. But most of what's achieved in trade and financial services is done regulator to regulator. So we have the US-UK uh, Financial Regulatory Working Group, which you know, meets regularly with senior officials from the US and UK, obviously. We have a dialogue, a very advanced dialogue with the Swiss to, to get an MRA, which will be done by the end of the year. And then we use the economic and financial dialogue. We've had those recently with Brazil, with India. Uh, we have a very deep dialogue with the regulators in Singapore. Um, uh, I'm going to Luxembourg tonight. We have dialogue bilaterally with others uh, so that we understand the views of different member states <coughs> in the EU as well. Um, so I would say it's... With respect to your question directly, um, I don't think I'm not aware of personally where regulators come into the trade agreements because in financial services the default is that we have an ongoing regulatory dialogue jurisdictions to jurisdictions as per what we can achieve where we've got like-minded. So with the Swiss we've got a very common ambition on, at a wholesale level um, to do deliver quite a lot. Okay, so. Are there tensions between the government's desire for trade deals um, and uh, and maintaining high regulatory 
standards? Uh, or do you, do, you, do you think that the government's managing to navigate um, through this agenda of getting new trade deals while, while sort of keeping a firm hand on maintaining standards, strong regulatory standards? I'm not aware of any time where financial services standards of regulation have been threatened in a trade conversation. I mean, what I would say is across the whole of government, there will be different trade-offs. Obviously, we can't have everything in every trade deal. And obviously, we have right rounds and conversations across government. And then Cabinet and Prime Minister will ultimately make those decisions where those, those trade-offs have to be made. I mean, the, I suppose it'll, it's, it, it'll be a case of, uh, as negotiations happen, happen, start to happen, yeah. I mean, let's take the US, for instance, during the, during the period when there were, this was a live discussion around trade agreements with the US, there were concerns about not necessarily financial regulation, but concerns about regulatory standards um, and where the, 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 there may need to be uh, some compromises, uh, uh, for instance, in relation to food standards. So I'm just wondering if, there, if you see, foresee any, if you can anticipate any situation where there may be some tensions between uh, our regulatory framework and standards and um, uh, uh, countries that we want to do trade work, uh, trade deals where they may want something, something different or are you confident that that's not going to be the case and if it is then you know we, we'll be able to safeguard the standards that we've got I'm not aware of any pressure in okay. financial services for standards to be compromised in the context of trade deals okay and then just one final question which is back to this this point about um, money laundering and organized crime and mm. and the estimate of about 100 billion pounds of dirty money flowing through through um, uh, uh, at the UK and mm. the financial sector. Um, do you feel, obviously this is pre-Brexit, given, as you said, we've got a very big financial services sector. Do, are you confident with the points about, the, the, the obviously we've got the economic crime bill, but in terms of going forward and what you're looking at um, post-Brexit and finan future financial services, that we can put in the, the right mechanisms um, to ensure that we really bear down on um, uh, on those numbers, those sorts of numbers. Um, the interventions that are coming, the emergency legislation should help, but the additional interventions, what, what might they be? And is there a focus um, on looking at how the future of financial regulation picks up on these issues so that we, you know, we, we can be confident that, uh, that, that we're not going to be, we're not going to continue to have this ongoing problem? Yes, of course. I mean, the interventions we're making next week are the start of that. We've set out where we'll do more in the next session. I'd go back to the Financial Action Task Force report, the mutual evaluation we had in December 2018, which did give us a few areas amidst an exceptionally positive uh, report. And those are largely now going to be dealt with by this legislation. But I'd go back to my very opening remarks to the Chair with respect to the complexity in financial services. One area that I think is something we've got to get right we want to be on the right side of innovation, but we want to deal with the risks inherent is in cryptocurrency, digital assets, and the platforms, uh, you know, the, the, whole, the whole matter of how that and blockchain impacts financial markets. These are complex matters, best done with as much consensus as possible. But I have to recognize we're also in a competitive dynamic with Switzerland in particular and other jurisdictions. And so, you know, that's something that we give a lot of thought to and obviously we don't want to displace um, risk from one area to another so I would say that um, we, our work's never done you know we've got the legislative framework and the, the innovations I've spoken about mm -hmm. but there'll be more things and more things to do always because you know bad actors have always existed and they migrate into different places.